Hello and, and welcome to this ninth Bible study in the miracles of Jesus. We're using the metaphor of an onion and we're trying to peel away some of the outer layers of the miracles to get to the heart of the matter. And John told us what the heart of the matter is. He said that by miraculous signs, Jesus thus revealed his glory. So we are looking at the miracles, but we're looking at what they are pointing towards. We've considered so far three resurrections, nine nature miracles, three healings of outcasts, three healings of Gentiles, five healings of blind people, and four healings of mute people. That's 27 out of the 35 incidents which are recorded in our Gospels. Today we're looking at healings that Jesus performed on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day was Saturday, of course, and there were seven miracles he did on that day. We're just going to consider uh, a few of them today. We've done one already. The story of the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, and Jesus repeated the words, I am the light of the world. That miracle took place spontaneously by Jesus on the Sabbath day. Let me tell you a little, little bit about the Sabbath, as you know. Um, in Genesis, God created all that is in seven days and rested on the seventh. He ceased from his work, so to speak, on the seventh day. And that was brought into the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment, commandment requiring the covenanted people of God every Saturday to rest. In fact, it was from sunset on Friday until sunset on Saturday that they were required not to work. Now, when the people of Judah were taken into exile in the time of Jeremiah, they could no longer follow their religion. They couldn't worship in the way they had. They couldn't sacrifice any animals. The priests had nothing to do. How were they going to maintain their identity? Well, there were three identifiers which they clung to in exile. One was circumcision. They continued to circumcise their little boys on the eighth day of life. Another one was the food laws. So they went back to Moses and rediscovered what foods they were allowed to eat and which foods were unclean for them, and they adhered to those laws. And the other identifier was Sabbath observance. People who didn't work on Saturdays were clearly Jewish. And then in order to make sure that the Jews didn't infringe this Sabbath rule, the scribes, the teachers, and later the Pharisees, built up around that rule other little rules to make sure nobody got near to breaking them. Near to my house is a bungalow with a very stout, well-built brick wall. It didn't used to be there. Some years ago, somebody came careering down a, a hill, swerved off the road, drove straight through their wooden fence across the lawn and ended up in the front room. So they've built a stout wall to stop anybody infringing on their privacy in their front room. And this is what they did with these laws. They took the laws of Moses and they built walls around them so that nobody would get anywhere near to breaking them. Let me give you some examples. The rabbis used to debate, were you allowed to eat the egg of a hen which had laid the egg on the Sabbath day. There was a conundrum for you. Another rule they had was that a woman must not look in a mirror on the Sabbath day because if she did, she might be tempted to pluck out her grey hair. If you came across somebody who was wounded on the Sabbath, you were allowed to lay a piece of lint or clean cloth on the wound, but you were not allowed to tie it up. If you had a sore throat, you were allowed to swallow vinegar, but you weren't allowed to gargle with it. You weren't allowed to carry a burden on the Sabbath day. We'll come to that later. And therefore, you weren't allowed to wear your false teeth. And you weren't allowed to walk very far on the Sabbath, not much more than about a thousand paces, which is why synagogues were so frequent in Judea in the time of our Lord. There were 139 regulations trying to protect the sanctity of the Sabbath day. Well, let's turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 21, where we read of Jesus exorcising a man on the Sabbath day. It's also in Luke chapter 4. I'm reading from Mark. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, 
because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This story is one of the earliest miracles of Jesus. It took place at a very early stage in his ministry in Galilee when his headquarters was in Capernaum. The teachers of the law, when they were teaching the Old Testament, always appealed to precedent, rather like lawyers in our English courts. So if they had some rule of Moses that they needed to explain, they would try and find out what rabbis of a previous generation had taught about that law, and they would pass it on. Jesus didn't teach that way. He said, I say to you, just as in the Old Testament, God has spoken through the prophets, thus says the Lord, Jesus said, I say to you with personal authority from God. Now this evil spirit recognised who Jesus was. We've come across this before. You remember Legion and his friend? The evil spirit recognised who Jesus was. Remember the, uh, the boy who was possessed at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration? The spirit in him recognised who Jesus was. And the spirit said to Jesus, clear off, go away. What do you want with us? We don't want you here. We don't want you here. Anyway, we're scared of you. Just push off. Jesus said, be quiet, come out of him. Notice that Jesus was not easily startled by evil spirits. But evil spirits were very startled at the presence of Jesus. And this man shook violently and shrieked, and then he was set free. And this story's sign is that Jesus has authority to teach, and he has authority over demons. He even has authority to teach on the Sabbath day and to heal on the Sabbath day, as we shall see as we go on in this talk. The second healing on a Sabbath follows. It's in Mark chapter 1, verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. This story is also in Matthew and in Luke. Luke, the doctor, says that Peter's mother-in-law was in a high fever. Again, we see Jesus taking the initiative. There's no request for healing, no demand for faith, no recognition that Jesus is the son of David, no expectation of blessing. Jesus takes control and shows the initiative. Just as he had touched the coffin of the man from Nain, who he raised from the dead, and just as Jesus had touched the leper, Jesus held this woman by her hand, healed her and raised her up. And then she waited on them. Matthew emphasises that she waited on Jesus. Mark emphasises that she waited on all of those five men. And then in verse 32, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick. I wonder why that would be after sunset? Well, because it was Saturday and the Sabbath ended at sunset on Saturday. So the people, feeling it was their opportunity, brought to Jesus many to be healed at the end of that Saturday. Again, Jesus is showing his authority over illness. He has the authority and the power to heal on the Sabbath day. We now turn over the page to Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. The healing of a man with a shriveled hand. 
but I'm beginning the story at the end of the previous story. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked round at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. In all three Gospels, this story follows upon the plucking of ears of corn by Jesus and the disciples on the Sabbath day. And they had been criticised for farming. They were technically reaping and they were preparing the corn for eating, which was a breach of the law, or so they said. Jesus said two explosive things about the Sabbath. He said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, the first explosion was his use of the word Son of Man. This was the title Jesus used of himself most often. I need to spend a little bit of time on it. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet there is often spoken of as Son of Man, Son of Man, get up, Son of Man, Go over there, son of man, do something else. In other words, it just means a man, a person, a human being. But in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has this spectacular vision of the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, approaching the ancient of days, God. God gave to the son of man authority, glory and sovereign power. God said that all peoples and all languages would worship the Son of Man, and to the Son of Man was given an everlasting kingdom, a dominion that would never be destroyed. Now that is messianic talk. That is prophecy about the coming Messiah. So Jesus, using this title, is claiming to be this great Son of Man who is to be given an eternal kingdom by the Father and will be worshipped by all people. And he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. No, no, they all thought. God is Lord of the Sabbath. Yahweh is Lord of the Sabbath. What are you doing saying the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath? So the authorities were looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus. The Pharisees were on the prowl. It says there in chapter 3, verse 2, they were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. In the synagogue, on the Sabbath day, was this man with a useless hand. Luke says it was his right hand. If he was right dominant, it was the hand he would have worked with. He couldn't make his living. Jesus could read their minds. Luke tells us Jesus knew what they were thinking. And unusually, Jesus made this man the centre of attention. Remember, often he took people aside He took people into a private place to heal them, or he took them outside of a village to heal them. But this one, this time Jesus said, stand up in front of everyone. Jesus wanted everyone to see, you are allowed to do good things on Saturdays. Matthew recalls that Jesus said, if you had a sheep that fell into a pit, you'd put it out on the Sabbath day. That's what they would do. They were allowed to do that. That is something good and kind to a sheep. Well, said Jesus, I'm going to do something good and kind to this man. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? They could hardly say no, could they? Is it lawful to do evil on the Sabbath? They could hardly say yes, could they? It was a tricky question. Jesus had got them caught by this question. Is it lawful to save life or to kill on the Sabbath day? So if it's all right with you, I'll go ahead and I'll do this good thing and this kind thing to this man on the Sabbath day. While Jesus was thinking of healing, the Pharisees were thinking of killing. While Jesus was thinking of mercy, the Pharisees were thinking of murder. 
and he told the man to do that which he could not do. He said, stretch out your hand. And then we see a range of emotions mentioned. In, in Jesus' anger and deep distress. Did you know the Gospels ever spoke of Jesus getting angry? They do. He was angry and distressed at their stubborn hearts. The way they were prepared to treat this man because of their legalistic interpretation of the law. And Luke tells us that the Pharisees, they were furious. And they plotted with the Herodians how to kill Jesus. Now, there were three political parties in Judea at that time. There were the Sadducees. They were the aristocratic priests, the posh people, the wealthy people, the people who ran the temple. They liked the Romans being in Judea because as long as the Romans were there, the Sadducees were in power. The Pharisees were at the opposite extreme of that political dimension. They hated the Romans. They detested Gentile rule. They wanted the Romans out almost at any cost. But they got together with the Herodians. This third party was a godless party. They, they didn't love the Lord at all. They were merely devoted to politics and to pleasure and to fun and to supporting the Herod family. The Herod family was the most grossly immoral family you could come across. And they wanted the Herods in power. The Herods were appointed by the Romans. So you have these two political opposites, Pharisees and Herodians, uniting together. What an irony. What brings them together? Their hatred of Jesus. They're looking for a way to murder him. And so we see in this story a sign of Jesus' glory. Jesus has the authority to interpret God's law. Not the Pharisees, not the scribes, not the elders, not the priests. Jesus has the authority to interpret God's law. And Jesus is the son of man who is doing it. This was incendiary as far as the Pharisees were concerned and they wanted Jesus gone. The next story we're looking at today is to be found in John's Gospel, chapter 5. And we're now in Jerusalem near to the pool of Bethesda. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath... The Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even, even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This story is only to be found in John's Gospel. And in the previous chapter, Jesus had just healed the courtiers, uh, son in Cana in Galilee, but now he's travelled south to, to Judea, to Jerusalem, by the pool of Bethesda, which is just north of the Temple Mount. He was there for a feast, Passover, Tabernacles, uh, Pentecost, we don't know which. We do know in John's Gospel three Passovers are mentioned, which is why we believe that Jesus' ministry 
lasted a maximum of three years. If this was a Passover, that would be a fourth Passover, which would mean that Jesus' ministry might have lasted up to four years. But we don't know what it was. We can't be sure. The word Bethesda means house of mercy. And this man had been trying to get down into the waters when they were stirred, believing that he would be healed if he was the first to get into the waters. Notice that there were many people there who wanted to be healed in those waters, but only one was. You sometimes hear it loosely said that Jesus healed everybody. This story shows that that isn't the case. Jesus chose to heal one man, this man, for a particular purpose. If we'd read on in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, after Jesus had healed Simon's mother-in-law, we would have read that when Jesus went to bed that night, he got up very early the next day, went out into the mountains to pray. Meanwhile, crowds gathered at dawn, at the door of the house where Jesus had been sleeping. And Simon Peter came and found Jesus and said, you better come back and heal with these people, that they're wanting your blessing. And Jesus said, no, I haven't come to heal, I've come to preach the kingdom of God. We need to move on to other villages. You see, when you read the Gospels carefully, we see that Jesus didn't heal everybody who was there who might have been blessed in that particular way. This man has been paralysed or lame or suffering from extreme weakness for 38 years. Now, in the first century AD, an average lifespan was 35 years. So this man had lived longer ill than many of his contemporaries have lived well. That's why Jesus said, do you want to get well? This man had spent his whole life begging for his living. He lived on charity from the word go, really. If he got well, how's he going to raise a living? He might have to learn a skill. He might have to get a trade. He must, may have to learn how to earn a living. So Jesus said, do you want to get well? And he didn't say yes or no. And the man says, well, I, I, I can't get down into the waters. Nobody will help me. He couldn't help himself. And Jesus did help him. No request. No faith. He didn't ask to be recognised as the son of David. The man wasn't expecting healing. He didn't even know Jesus' name. And when he got up and walked, carrying his mat, the Jews said, ah, carrying the mat on the Sabbath day is forbidden by Moses. That was not true. It was their interpretation of the law which was being broken, not the law itself. Now in Jeremiah chapter 17, the prophet does say, be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. But he wasn't talking about somebody who'd just been healed carrying his bed mat rolled up. He was talking about trade. He was talking about merchants. He was talking about businessmen bringing goods into the city for sale on the Sabbath day. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. This man who had been healed had no idea who Jesus was. And the authorities feel their contempt. They said, who is this fellow who told you to pick the bed up and walk? But this fellow, sorry, this man didn't know who this fellow was. And in the temple, Jesus and the man met. And Jesus said to him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, Jesus never explicitly linked illness with sin. Especially this man, he'd been ill for 38 years. He must have been a little child when he first became ill. Why would he say that to this man? I'm thinking, if this man had been ill for 38 years and been able to do nothing, and now he's up, he's walking, he's free, he can do what he likes, I think he's thinking to himself, ah, I'm going to enjoy myself, wine, women and song. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a good time now that I can. Jesus warned him of the dangers of a sinful life and said, if you come to the judgment of God in a sinful state, then your fate will be worse then than it was in this life, being unable to walk. Now, this healing on the Sabbath had outraged the Jews, the established leaders of Israel. It says in verse 16, the Jews persecuted him. And Jesus made matters worse In verse 17, he said, well, if God my Father can work on the Sabbath day, so can I. Now, it was agreed by everybody that although God rested on the Sabbath day, 
It is God who sustains the universe. It is God who keeps the planets and the stars in their courses. It is God who keeps the, the, the harvest and the springtime and, and the summer and all, all the work of growing things going. God doesn't stop everything on the Sabbath day. It was recognised that God sustains the universe and normal life on the Sabbath day. And Jesus is saying, if God can work on the Sabbath day, so can I. Can you imagine how much angry that made them? Then in verse 19, he said, if I'm God's unique son, and I only do what God tells me to do. In other words, I heal on the Sabbath day because the Father has told me to do that. In verse 20, he said, my Father shares everything with me. And then in verse 21, he said, the Father raises the dead, and that's what I'm going to do as well. Look at verse 22, 25. I tell you the truth, a time is coming, and it has now come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Jesus is going to raise people from the dead, something that only God could do. And then he goes on to say, God is the judge of all men, but God has delegated the day of judgment to me. And then in verse 30, he says, everything I do pleases my Father. Can you imagine how angry they were? No wonder it says in verse 18, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling him God, his own Father, making himself equal with God. You see what this sign is pointing towards? If God the Father can work on the Sabbath day, I can work on the Sabbath day, I can work on the Sabbath day because I am equal with God. So briefly, we've looked at five Sabbath day healings today. We began with the man who was born blind. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We then went on to look at the story of the exorcised man in the synagogue in Capernaum who cried out to Jesus and Jesus delivered him and set him free. We then looked at Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law who was in a high fever. We then saw Jesus healing a man who had a withered hand in the synagogue claiming to be the son of man, claiming to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And then we have Jesus healing a man at the pool of Bethesda saying, if God can work on Saturdays, so can I. You see, these stories are pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man. They're pointing to Jesus, to his authority to teach and to heal and to exorcise. They are pointing to Jesus, making himself equal with God. In the words of Charles Wesley, our God contracted to a span incomprehensibly made man. Glory to God and his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.